Um, currently, we do not have elders here at the Chestnut Mountain Church of Christ, and so uh, currently we are relying on the scriptural uh, pattern and example of, of men uh, leading in, in worship in, in the local church. And so in lieu of an eldership, uh, the men who are members here, members at this local congregation, are managing uh, the church's business. Uh, but when it is possible, we need to appoint an eldership, and that is one of the goals we are uh, working towards. And that's why I have been uh, again, occasionally delivering sermons on what the New Testament tells us about elders in general and also uh, some of the specific requirements. Um, it is part of God's plan for how the church is organized to have, to have an eldership. So I have in the past covered some general principles. And uh, with these ongoing lessons, I'm getting more into the specifics. Uh, the specific requirements for a man to serve as a bishop. And if you have your Bible with you tonight, I would encourage you to turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 3. We'll be reading from there tonight, 1 Timothy chapter 3. And uh, I would like to make some headway through some of these specifics. So we have uh, several more points than I typically have in one sermon. You know, as some people say it's almost scriptural. You have to have three points in a poem. And that's what a sermon is. Uh, you know, a lot of times I'll have two points. Here we're having uh, a lot of points, but so I'm going to keep it, you know, uh, somewhat brief tonight. We're not going to you know, spend an hour on this topic. Um, so all these specific points, uh, these are uh, described in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 3. The, the elder is to have uh, these qualities. And again, there's several more listed that we won't be covering tonight for, for time's sake. Um, so without further ado, uh, the first point that we're going to cover tonight is being vigilant. Uh, the first qualification uh, is vigilance. A bishop uh, must be vigilant. Um, so let's go ahead and read from 1 Timothy 3, and we'll read verses 1 through 3. The Bible says, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, other versions might say overseer, right? Bishop or overseer. Uh, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. And then there's more qualifications as you keep uh, reading. Uh, so again, we're going to start with vigilance. A bishop must be uh, vigilant is one of the uh, God-given uh, prerequisites for a man to serve as an elder. Now, I'm preaching from the King James Version tonight, as, as I typically do. And as we go through this, I will mention uh, some other translations just for the sake of comparison. So, again, the King James, um, right after, let's see, if we go to verse 2, um, right after it mentions him being the husband of one wife, the very first word there in verse 2 is vigilant. The husband of one wife, and the King James says vigilant. He must be vigilant. Now, instead of vigilant, some other versions translate this word as temperate. Right? That's how the New King James Version reads. Uh, this is also how the NIV and the New American Standard Version reads and several other uh, versions I've, I've looked at. So, uh, again, instead of vigilant, they'll say he must be temperate. Um, the English Standard Version says... He must be sober-minded. He must be sober-minded. And uh, so what does this mean? Well, the, the Greek word being translated here um, indicates a person whose, whose thinking is not affected by alcohol or other mind-altering substances. And I encourage you to, to keep that in mind uh, and think about that because that will relate to some of the other uh, qualifications we read about here in just a moment. So, again, the King James translates this, this word as vigilant, right? Vigilant means watchful. So, again, if you think about it, if you, if you don't have any mind-altering substances in your body, in your brain, uh, you're going to be vigilant. You're going to be watchful. You're going to be clear-headed. So, that's the, that's the first thing mentioned here. Vigilant, right? Temperate, sober-minded. Um, so, next, again, looking at the, the King James Version is the word sober. The uh, bishop must be sober. Now, the Greek word being translated here is sophron. 
And uh, this is an interesting word, you know, words that are very unique in the Greek and don't really have an English equivalent, oftentimes they're translated a number of different ways. And, and sophron is one of those unique uh, words. If you uh, study this, this uh, word, it literally means a saved mind or a delivered mind. So it's a very unique word and there's not really an English equivalent to that concept. So if you look at translations, it will, again, translate this term differently. Uh, the New King James and the American Standard say sober-minded, right? So, again, just kind of following the, the sequence of qualifications in verse 2, mentions him being married. Then the King James says vigilant. And then the next word in verse 2 is sober. Again, the New King James, American Standard say sober-minded. Several other versions say self-controlled. He's to be self-controlled. And uh, this word's kind of tricky because at least when I hear the word sober, I think of, again, someone who's not using alcohol. They're sober in that sense. But that's not the direct meaning of the word here. And the word sober in this context would indicate a person who is serious or solemn when he needs to be. In other words, he's not someone who's constantly clowning around, uh, not thinking seriously about important issues, scriptural issues, uh, matters of faith. He takes those things seriously. Um, if you take the time to uh, look up the verb form of this word, it indicates a person who is sane. A person who is sane. A person who's in their right mind. And uh, notice what the Bible says in Mark 5, verse 15. And uh, if you're familiar with this story, this is the story about... The man who's possessed with many demons, a legion of demons, and is a wild, crazy guy. And Jesus cast out these demons. And uh, notice what it says here. Mark 5, verse 15. And they, they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. So the people here, they knew of this man who acted wild and crazy and did things normal people don't do and then jesus casts out these unclean spirits and now they see him clothed in his right mind and that scared them you know general uh, genuine miracles when they were performed a lot of times in the bible people's response was fear because i mean they're seeing something that's can't be explained so they see this man in his right mind and scared him they're afraid and I bring up this verse because, again, that phrase, in his right mind, and that's just one word in the Greek, and it's the word sober that we've been looking at. So, again, that's what the word sober means uh, regarding the, the elder and his qualification. Um, again, he's a, he's, a, he's a man who thinks seriously, a man who thinks rationally. He's, he's in his right mind. And uh, I would like just to, to point out, when we think about the qualifications for elders listed in uh, 1 Timothy 3 and other passages, um, we should not get this mindset, well, that's for elders. And so, you know, I can tune out. I don't really need to pay attention to that. Well, just, you know, generally speaking, almost all of these qualifications apply to all Christians. Uh, these, are, these are the kinds of uh, behaviors or conduct God wants from all believers. And again, we find this word mentioned in Titus chapter 2, Again, regarding just Christians in general. So Titus 2, verse 2 says, The aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, charity, and patience. So this is why, you know, doing word studies is interesting. So the word sober here is not the word we're talking about. If you look at the Greek, it's a different word. The word sober, uh, sophron, is actually the word temperate here in verse 2. So again, men who are older in the church, older Christians, we're encouraged to be temperate. Uh, in verse 5, speaking about young women in the church, how the, the older women are to teach the younger women. And again, it's translated differently, but in the Greek, it's that same word, a sophron again. The younger women are to be discreet. So again, to again use rational thinking, to uh, uh, think seriously about important issues. In that sense, you know, it's translated here as discreet. In Titus 2, verse 5, discreet, chase keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. That the word of God be not uh, blasphemed. So again, regarding all Christians, God wants us as best we can to be rational thinkers, uh, to be serious thinkers about important issues. 
And again, when we look at the, the qualities of, of elders, uh, that's one of the things we find listed, that the elder is to be someone who's again, sober-minded, self-controlled, uh, again, a, rash, a, a man who thinks rationally. Um, next in our list, going back to 1 Timothy 3, we find the phrase, of good behavior. So 1 Timothy 3, verse 2, again, a, a bishop must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober. And then we find this phrase of, in you know, King James, of good behavior. Um, now, again, comparing translations, some versions read a little differently. Instead of that phrase of good behavior, there's quite a few that will say orderly. He must be orderly. I found several other versions that say respectable. Uh, this man ought to be respectable. Um, let me share another Greek word with you, and I think this is one you've probably heard before. Actually, two Greek words. Chaos and cosmos. Right? Chaos versus cosmos. Chaos means disorder. means confusion. Everything's in a jumble. You know, things are chaotic. Uh, cosmos is the opposite. Cosmos means order. Or, you know, people say cosmos, referring to the universe. You know, cos cosmos, cosmos, same thing. You know, potato, potato. But, you know, it just mean, it means order, harmony, and thus... By way of extension, what is, what is proper and good, there's a moral element to this word cosmos, cosmos. And uh, I mention that because that's what we find here in this, uh, this text. That phrase, of good behavior, and in the King James, that's translating one word, and it's the word cosmion, which is cosmos. So again, just to explain this and put it in my own words, uh, the bishop is the kind of man who's, whose life is not just a chaotic mess a jumble and so on. Uh, he's the type of man who trusts in what God says is good. And uh, this is an interesting word. Again, if you take the time to look it up in some other passages, uh, it can also indicate modesty. Cosmos can uh, indicate modesty. That's how it's translated in 1 Timothy 2 verse 9. Uh, there we read about modest apparel or respectable apparel. Again, the word modest or respectable there is, again, the word cosmos. So, again, it's applied not only to how we conduct ourselves and how we think about things, um, but also how we act, you know, how we dress ourselves and so on, our actions. Are our actions respectable? And so, again, this is something that's uh, prescribed for Christians in general and for bishops Specifically in, in this passage. Um, again, next is given to hospitality. Again, looking at the, the qualifications in 1 Timothy 3, uh, it tells us that the elders is a man who's given to hospitality. Now, I think hospitality was more significant in the first century when people could not travel as easily as we can travel nowadays and people did not have as much money as we have nowadays. And um, hotels and inns and things like that, they did exist, but there weren't as many as there were in the ancient world. So being hospitable was uh, an important aspect of life in the Roman Empire in the first century. But hospitality is still uh, important uh, today. Um, the heart of hospitality is being friendly to all people. Being friendly to all people. And so when we think about uh, an elder, an elder is not the kind of person uh, who would shy away from having guests in his home, uh, wanting to be a good host, uh, and so on. And uh, as we look at these qualifications, there's definitely some overlap between one, one qualification or the, the other, or at least there's, there's correlations between um, some of the qualifications here. Um, being hospitable, at least to me, just seems common sense. That's going to relate to the qualification of marriage, that the bishop is a married man. And I hope I don't offend any ladies, but I think, you know, women especially, more than men, women are more, I think, concerned with how the home looks, that it's inviting, that it's kind of like a nice place. You know, there might be men like that as well, but to me, it seems like, and again, ladies, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like ladies gravitate toward that a little bit more than, uh, than men. And uh, I think, again, a man being married, 
Uh, you're going to feel more comfortable in his home, especially a woman is going to be more comfortable in the home of a married man in contrast to a single man. So I think him being married is going to play a role in how hospitable he is and him opening up his home to, to have people um, over and be a good host uh, for people. Um, next in this context, it mentions him being apt to teach. An elder must be apt to teach. A bishop must be apt to teach. Now, as I said, there, are, there is a correlation between several of the qualifi qualifications listed here. Um, we mentioned, uh, I briefly went over, you know, vigilant. He's to be vigilant, meaning free from alcohol and, and other mind-altering uh, substances. Uh, he's to be sober, again, indicating he's a rational thinker. He's in his right mind. Again, if a man has those qualities, that's going to aid him in being a good teacher of God's word, right? So a bishop, an elder, uh, what the New Testament also calls a shepherd and a pastor, um, is a man who is skillful in teaching God's word. Right? That's what apt to teach would indicate. Right? Apt to teach doesn't mean he's a good math teacher, right? although there's nothing wrong with that. Right? We're talking about God's word and him teaching and communicating the word of God. Um, and so he's going to be skillful in teaching God's word. Now, when and where should an elder teach? This qualification does not necessarily mean that the elder uh, is, is teaching every week or something like that. Um, if you have a Bible, keep it marked here in, in Timothy. And uh, let's turn over to the book of Titus, Titus chapter 1. Unfortunately, because of the influence of denominationalism, uh, many people today think a preacher and a pastor are one and the same. And, and they're not. What the New Testament says about preachers, ministers, evangelists, teachers, they're not the same thing as bishops, as elders. They're, they're different roles in the church. In the local church, the bulk of preaching and teaching is going to be done by the man or if a congregation is big enough, men uh, who are their, their preachers and teachers. And uh, I think it's a good practice for elders to teach you know, on a somewhat regular basis to give devotionals and things like that. Nothing wrong with that at all. But I don't think that's what the qualification apt to teach is about. It's not about them get, getting up and giving a Bible class, right? Well, what is it about then? Read Titus chapter one with me, Titus one. And let's start with verse nine. Again, this is a context about elders and uh, their duties within the local church. Titus one, let's start with verse nine, Titus one, verse nine. It says, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and convince the gainsayers. Again, gainsayers are people who speak con contrary to Christ in the New Testament. Uh, verse 10, it says, For there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses, teaching things which they ought not for filthy lucre's sake. One of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, The Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies. This witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. And boy, isn't that last verse re relevant today? How many people are following the commandments of men and because of that, they've turned away from the truth of what the Bible uh, teaches. So again, this is why an elder needs to be a skillful teacher or apt to teach, because the eldership is to recognize and speak against false doctrine, right? And in order to do that, you have to know the Bible well. You have to be able to teach the Bible uh, well. Again, if a man does not have a decent grasp on the truth, how can he know what is false? Right. I think one of my favorite illustrations is is the money that we use. Right. Let's say, hey, I'm giving away three hundred dollar bills. And you say, great, give me a couple of those, Seth. 
and I hand you over, you know, some money and it's, it's bright pink. And I wrote a hundred on it. It says, it says a hundred on it. Well, you immediately know well, this ain't right. You know, where's my money, Seth? Well, that's it. That's it. You don't like it? Why don't you like it? We well, don't like it because everyone knows the standard. We know what the real deal is, right? It's got to be green, especially with the bigger, you know, uh, the bigger denominations. You know, they have special holograms on them and all this stuff, right? We know the standard. And so when something comes that's false, and it's obviously false, we know it's false, right? Well, same thing with the word of God. If you, if you don't know the standard and someone's hand, handing you a, a purple $100 bill, you're not going to know the difference if someone's can, trying to sell you a bridge or something. So, uh, again, this is why elders need to be skillful in, in teaching because it's their job to protect the, the local congregation against false teaching, whether it's coming from something happening in our culture or maybe someone's come into the church and is trying to spread false teaching or something like that. Uh, that's that's why uh, an elder is to be apt uh, to teach. And I think there's several other relevant reasons um, uh, as well. You know, think about it throughout the course of time in, in the local church, individuals and couples, they're going to approach an eldership with questions, uh, wanting biblical guidance. And if that eldership is going to help those in the church in the better acquainted they are with what the Bible teaches, the more effective they're going to be. And helping people um, and empowering people through what the Bible teaches. So again, the overall purpose of being apt to teach, again, is not that the elder is up every Sunday giving sermons or giving Bible classes or something like that. Uh, again, that would basically do away with having preachers and ministers. Um, and again, people have tried to merge those two things when they're, again, they are different in the New Testament. Again, the purpose of being apt to teach would apply mainly to the shepherd's oversight and protection uh, of the local church. Um, and the last point I'll cover uh, tonight is the, the scriptures say the, the elder is not to be given to wine. A bishop must not be given to wine. So let's go back to uh, 1 Timothy 3. And again, this is, this is the first thing mentioned in verse 3. So 1 Timothy 3 verse 3. Uh, it says you're not given to wine. And uh, I would encourage you to compare some translations. And I think some translations here are very poor in quality. This is actually quite a strong statement in the Greek. And the Greek, it literally says he's not even to be around wine. That's how the Greek reads. So he's not even to be around wine is, is literally what the Greek says. And once again, this would relate to the other qualifications that we briefly reviewed tonight. Again, the elder is to be vigilant. Again, when you look up that word, it's the idea of being uh, his mind is not affected by alcohol and other mind altering substances. Uh, he's to be sober, meaning he's a rational thinker. He's a serious thinker. Uh, he's in his right mind. Um, he's to be apt to teach. You know, if someone's chronically abusing alcohol. That's going to make it, I think, harder for him to be a, a skillful teacher. And so on. So all these things are, are related. Uh, the drinking of alcohol is quite common in our culture. It's become uh, a thing that's quite normal nowadays. Many professing Christians, when they come across these kinds of uh, prohibitions, right, in Scripture. So again, not given to wine is what it says here. Uh, a lot of Christians uh, today, they've been persuaded to believe that the Bible teaches drinking is fine as long as you don't get drunk. That's kind of the one of the lines I've heard quite a bit and, and again, to justify social, social drinking. Um, and so there are again people today who will claim to be Christians and they'll think just drinking recreationally, um, drinking moderately. That that's perfectly in line with what the Bible is teaching us. And I submit for your consideration tonight, that's not true. Um, not only does God want a bishop to stay away from, from wine, but he also wants that from all Christians. And again, we'll see, we'll see that in a, another context in just a moment. When a person consumes alcohol, before he or she gets that, that buzz feeling or that feeling of euphoria, the alcohol has already affected 
that person's judgment, that person's thinking. And I think this is just common knowledge. It's common knowledge that alcohol impairs your judgment. And again, you ought to know that impairment, it takes place with the first drink. Now, obviously, it's going to change how, how much someone drinks. But with you know one beer, one glass of wine, one shot, whatever is one drink, uh, your thinking will be affected with that one, that one drink. And again, what do all beer and alcohol commercials typically say at the end of the commercial? Right? Please drink responsibly. And so even people in the world understand there's an inherent danger uh, in drinking. That's just so hypocritical to me. They, they say, please drink responsibly. And yet they're selling you a product that if you consume it, it's going to take away your ability to think and act responsibly. And people will use the expression, it lowers your, your inhibitions. And that's true. Again, that's just another way of saying it affects your, your judgment, your way of thinking. And again, that lowering of your inhibitions, that, that effect it has on your judgment, again, that takes place before your motor functions are impaired, before you feel a, a sedated feeling or feeling of euphoria. Your thinking is the first thing that alcohol affects. Um, and, and again, if... An elder, if all these qualifications are to be taken seriously, that he's to be vigilant, sober-minded, a skillful teacher, how can he be using alcohol on a regular basis, recreationally, and still be fulfilling those other qualities, those other qualifications? Um, I've also heard people defend the use of alcohol by saying, well, it's good for your health. You know, I've, I've heard this line, maybe you've heard it as well, you know, uh, drinking wine is good for my heart. And so, I'll, you know, occasionally I'll drink a, a glass of wine or two and, you know, it's good for my health. Again, respectfully, I, I disagree with that. You know, if someone is genuinely concerned about the health of their heart, I think just uh, taking a brisk walk around the block will do way more, be more beneficial than sitting down and drinking some wine. Uh, alcohol is a poison. And, and that's why when a person drinks alcohol, they become intoxicated. Again, toxic is the root word there. It's a toxin. It's a poison. Now, a lot of things, of course, are, are poisonous. You know, so people can make that point about water, right? You drink enough water, it'll kill you. That's true, right? But obviously, alcohol is not necessary, right? We need water to live. And uh, most people can self-regulate how much water they drink. Not always the case with uh, with alcohol. And um, again, it is a poison. And uh, this is why drinking can be especially dangerous for uh, someone who doesn't weigh much. And I'm thinking probably more of a young person who might go to like a college party or something one day where people are drinking. And uh, someone who might drink excessively, especially if they're drinking hard liquor. And if the alcohol content gets high enough in their blood, they will literally die because they poison themselves. Right? It is, it is a poison. It's been proven time and time again that the chronic use of alcohol does not improve your health. It destroys your liver. It affects virtually everything in your body negatively, your heart, your blood pressure, everything. Pregnant women are instructed um, not to drink it. And again, just think about the fruit that it bears um, in our country. Hundreds of thousands of people in the United States are injured every year or even die because of the consumption of alcohol and alcohol-related incident, incidents like drunk driving, uh, domestic abuse, other criminal activity, and so on. And, and by the way, hundreds of thousands of people every year, right, injured and dying. And not one politician who wants to talk about safety for people and our citizens ever talk about, hey, maybe we should make alcohol harder to, for uh, people to get their hands on, right? Um, it's devastating to families and people in our country. And people who believe alcohol promotes health and wellness are turning a blind eye to the detrimental uh, effects it has. And I, I submit for consideration tonight that the New Testament does not teach us we should drink moderately, that we can drink just a little bit and do so recreationally. Um, I'd be interested in those verses that say that. And uh, before anyone jumps to, well, you know, Read John's gospel account. Jesus turned a bunch of water into wine, right? So they had a big, you know, big party. 
Well, we have to be careful that we do not take popular views about alcohol in 2024 and impose those views on what the New Testament says in the historical setting of the New Testament, which was written in the first century. The kind of alcohol Americans drink today is considerably stronger and more readily available than the kinds of alcohol described in the New Testament. And not only that, when I'm getting a little off track here, but if you can do some study and you look up the word wine as it's used in scripture, wine is a general term that just means anything from the grapevine, whether it's fresh juice or wine that was set out to be, become an intoxicating drink. All that's called wine um, in the New Testament. So just a few little breadcrumbs if you're interested in studying that uh, for you to, to think about. Um, again, please consider what the New Testament says for, again, us as Christians in general, not just elders. Uh, it says, therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. First Thessalonians 5, verses 6 through 8. So in the New Testament encourages... Soberness. And uh, if I could just give, you know, just a quick side note, but it is related. Uh, the New Testament doesn't just encourage soberness from alcohol, but from all mind altering substances. Now, if you're going to go have surgery, right, you know, of course, have the doctor put you out, you know, go under. Great. You know, good luck. But when it comes to people just doing this kind of thing for fun, for recreation, um, even nowadays, people will use. Uh, certain substances to have a religious experience. By the way, the Bible calls that witchcraft. That's what witchcraft is. That's part of occultism. Trying to experience God through getting high on something. That's not faith. Um, it, it's getting high on a drug. Right? That's all it is. Um, again, the, the New Testament encourages soberness. You know, clear thinking no matter what we're, we're putting in our, uh, our body. And again, it's just sad how uh, so many people, you know, I've heard stories about, you know, fentanyl and other crazy hard drugs coming into our country. And, you know, how many people uh, have have their minds messed up, their family messed up, their, their job situation messed up because they were convinced by, you know, some loser to take drugs and alcohol. Um, it's not worth worth the good feeling it might provide. It's not worth gambling. Uh, your life over, your physical life, your spiritual life. Again, we ought to, again, encourage people to do what the New Testament says. Again, we who are of the day, meaning those who are Christians, we ought to strive for clear thinking uh, as best we can. So, again, just a quick review, looking at these qualifications given uh, in 1 Timothy 3 about elders. And again, just this is the King James. The elder is uh, one who's vigilant. He's sober of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, and not given to wine. Uh, in summary, an elder is someone who models the teachings and ideals given to us uh, by Jesus. Uh, in fact, in 1 Peter 5, verse 3, the Bible teaches that you know, elders are to be examples to the flock. That's, that's the phrase used there, examples to the flock. So let us encourage men to set that example. And let us all, as followers of Christ, endeavor to show our neighbors and friends Jesus Christ through our choices and through how we, uh, through our conduct. Uh, 